行くぞよし Before I get started on this review, I do want to state that I am no expert in Japanese history. It's something that I just research as a hobby, really. Without further ado, enjoy. Sakamoto Ryoma no Ansatsu yori, wazuka su nen mai. Like a Dragon Ishin is a period timepiece by the studio that brought us the Yakuza franchise, RGG Studios, that follows Sakamoto Ryoma through the Bakumatsu period before the start of the Great Restoration, or what we know as the Meiji Restoration. The cast of characters are all played by the same cast in the Yakuza franchise, with Kiryu again stepping in to be the player controlled protagonist. Notice the resemblance? The sole fact is one of the reasons I tossed around in my head whether or not I would get the game, as I'm not the biggest fan of the Yakuza combat, but I absolutely love this time period of Japan. Now, after playing this game, I feel like I didn't give the Yakuza games enough time to develop their combat, as I didn't truly grasp the intricacies of the system, and Like a Dragon Ishin was my, oh, I get it now, moment. With this recent release on Steam for PC, I picked this game up and played it for the first time, and I do not regret a second of it. So here's my review of Like a Dragon Ishin. The game starts off with Sakamoto Ryoma returning to Tosa from Ido. Within the first hour of the game, you learn that Sakamoto does not agree with the politics of the feudal Japan caste system, the Tokugawa shogunate. <laughs> he shows this by protecting a woman who isn't bowing to two joshi, or upper class samurai, as she is desperately trying to find a doctor for her ailing daughter. Ending in Ryoma not only getting into a fistfight with said Joshi and winning, but also landing himself in jail. This act nearly perfectly encapsulates the real life of Sakamoto Ryoma's ideals. As someone who rejects the shogunate and strongly believed in the United States philosophy of all men are created equal. <laughs> Later, his adopted father, Yoshida Toyo, a Joshi and local magistrate of Tosa, uses his power to break Ryoma out of jail. There, you learn about the Tosa Loyalist Party, anti-shogunate samurai organization, and that you should go meet with your brother, Takechi Henpeita. After meeting with Takechi at his dojo, a meeting is set up with Toyo between the three of you, to discuss this revolution or potential coup, which ends with Toyo getting assassinated by a shinobi. Ryoma is then accused of assassinating Toyo and later commits Dupan, which is when a samurai leaves his master's domain and becomes a ronin. Now that's a lot to unpack, and that was only within the first hour of the game, and I even oversimplified the whole thing. While all the names mentioned are indeed people who actually existed in history, Takechi did form the Tosa Loyalist Party, and Sakamoto did indeed train in Edo, or modern day Tokyo, which the game has no problem reminding you of over and over and over again, that's about all that's accurate about this intro. And you'll notice that a lot in this game. Now the game actually begins. You find yourself waking up in a historically famous Japanese inn in Kyo, now modern day Kyoto, the Teradaya Inn, where you begin your journey to solving the puzzle of who killed your father, and the only lead that you have is the sword style the assailant used, the Tenen Rishin. So you go from dojo to dojo fighting different swordsmen to try and get information on that style. 
Here you find Ryoma has started using an alias, and that name is none other than another legendary swordsman, Saito Hajima. Saito? Yes, that Saito Hajima. Eventually, this rabbit hole leads you to the real life organization the Shinsengumi, who were basically known to be an independent police force for the samurai. Now this is when the game starts to blur those historical lines between Sakamoto Ryoma and Saito Hajima and combine a lot of aspects and key points of their life together. The story really does start to branch off a lot in an over-dramatization of those historical events. At first, the combat feels clunky, just like it felt in the Yakuza games. And this is where the game proved me wrong, because over time, as I began to unlock more skills and start to understand the mechanics of the combat, this is where the Yakuza formula really clicked for me. And it's an absolute joy. Swapping between the four styles of combat has you performing different combos depending on whatever you decide best handles each situation and turns you from being a brutal brawler picking up and throwing your enemies to a methodical swordsman dispatching your enemies with deadly precision, a gun wielding sword dancer spinning around the battlefield in a flurry of sword cuts and bullets, or just taking aim and doing some fancy wielding trick shooting, taking your enemies out from afar. And this is where your four skill trees come into play with your character's advancement. Sword, gun, gun sword, and fisticuffs. You have two ways to advance each tree. Your tree's respective orb color, which is gained by using that particular fighting style and cannot be refunded. And gray training orbs, which is gained from your character's level ups, which can be slotted in any tree and can be refunded with colored orbs in each tree. You also have additional unlocks, which can only be unlocked by learning the skill through a trainer at a dojo, which then allows you to place a skill orb into that slot. This adds a lot of depth to how you play your encounters out as the game progresses. And once you've mastered a particular combat style, both in game and on your controller, you really feel like these legendary samurai in history. Your biggest enemy in this game is going to be the beyond fucking terrible camera and targeting system that either has Ryoma staring off into the distance at some enemy off screen, or gets stuck on a box or clips through a wall and vibrates when you are trying to adjust it to see the person you're fighting. And most of the time, it's a very important person like a boss. There's also equipment that you can equip to progress Ryoma even further through a blacksmith upgrade system that feels kind of like a combination of Monster Hunter's blacksmith and Neo's blacksmith. You have to level up your smithy by enhancing, crafting, disassembling, and donating gear in order to get better unlocks. This is one aspect of the game I really did not like as I could not find a significant way to produce the amount of money I needed to progress the blacksmith until later in the game. And by then, I ended up just using some legendary loot drops from major encounters in the late game. While I understand that it's to gate you from becoming completely overpowered, it gates you for way too long. The final tool to pay attention to in developing your character in combat is your Shinsen Gumi Squad, which is basically a deck building game that offers you different benefits and powers that you can equip to each fighting style which comes with all the wackiness you'd expect from a Yakuza game. Like having a bear attack people, shooting lightning from your hands, throwing fireballs, creating gravity balls that suck everyone in, and the list goes on. I didn't much care for the system, but it did come in handy for a quick stun or invincibility frame, or if I needed to charge my heat meter up for some big attacks. Then there's the general upgrades that more or less helps you out in side content or out in the world, like upgrading your farm, sprinting for longer, getting a better fishing pole, or increasing carrying capacity. It uses a resource called Virtue, which is the easiest resource to gather due to it being something that's handed to you for nearly everything you do. 
which leads us down the road of side content. You have all the ingredients for a Yakuza game here, which has some really memorable, wacky, and oftentimes hilarious moments in the side content, juxtaposed to the very real and mostly serious main story. <laughs> the developers at RGG Studios must be insane to come up with some of this outlandish content they put Ryoma in. I think that's what makes Japanese humor so damn funny. In the early game, a good way to make money is to play a memorization game for a udon restaurant where you take people's orders and then press the correct series of buttons in the correct order as fast as you can, netting you 10% of your score in cash. Then there's karaoke. Yes, there's a karaoke bar in feudal Japan, even though karaoke didn't come about until 1971. The concept is simple. Hit the correlating buttons as your character sings the lyrics, and then you'll get a score and a letter grade at the end. Now, it's the music videos that come with it that makes it worth going through all the songs just to see what the developers have come up with. Then you have what I would argue is the biggest sub game and my personal favorite in Asian, managing your farm. You come across this farm when this girl's parents passed away and the landlord is trying to evict her. Most of your virtue upgrades go towards this one subsection of the game where you plant your farm, harvest your plants, and use your harvested crops and caught fish to cook meals and even send out orders to make cash. And this turns into your biggest money maker once it gets going. Every meal has its own mini game associated with it, which is fun at first, then starts to get really stale when you do it for the millionth time. They really should have added a quick make button that you can use after you perfect a dish for the first time or after you make the same dish for a set number of times. You can also get pets here that you find out in the world these pets will join you by doing that specific pet sub story and gaining favor with that animal, totaling three cats and three dogs. There's 74 sub stories in the game, which is what Yakuza games call their side quest content. And this content is very off the beaten path narratively. Some of these quests are wild, but in a good way, though I do wish they were voice acted as barely any of them have any voice acting at all. And then the last big side content that you have is your missions at the Shinsengumi, which has you taking on the equivalent to dungeons disconnected from the game world where you have to complete a number of tasks and beat the boss at the end of the level. This is a good way to gain combat experience, level up your squad, and recruit new members to your squad. Though it feels extremely generic and I didn't really engage in it much except to get clips for this video. Overall, I would recommend this game strongly to anyone who is looking for a game with a fantastic narrative and engaging combat, especially if you're a fan of this period of Japan and don't mind reading subtitles. It would be very weird if characters spoke fluent American English in feudal Japan. Even though the game released in 2014, they did some small updates to bring it to PC in 2023 while not being a true remake title like the recently dropped Resident Evil 4 but it still looks great. I really hope this isn't the last time that RGG Studios is going to step into this era because there is always room for more games featuring catching great white sharks with a fishing pole. Thank you for watching. See ya.